Hello, everyone. I'm Sheila Marmon. I'm the founder of Mirror Digital. Welcome to Mirror Moments, episode three. We are talking today with some leaders in the LGBTQ plus community and how their voices at the intersection of change are having an impact in our world. Um, and today I have Bunny Michael, uh, Kyle Saldivar, and Brixen Diamond. So to get started, I am going to let our fabulous panelists introduce themselves. And I'm going to get started with um, my colleague, Kyle Saldivar. Kyle, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, uh, my name is Kyle Saldivar. I'm born and raised in LA and a California boy. Um, I work as head of publisher development in uh, Mirror Digital. And what that basically means is my area of expertise is bringing niche and um, very specific publishers into the network of Mirror Digital that kind of help with reaching that audience of African American, Asian, Latinx, LGBTQ, and multicultural. So it's anywhere an audience can be. That's where my department works to bring people in and help the brand actually execute against that audience. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Bunny, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Well, hi, I'm Bunny Michael. I'm an artist, a writer, meme maker, musician. I host a podcast. And I generally just feel like, even though I do a lot of mediums with my creativity, it's all around the same message which is about accessing your higher self. So finding the love within you, how you can channel that love and make a difference in the world. Fabulous. And Brixen, last but not least, please tell us a little bit about your work. Well, thanks for having me, Mira Digital and Sheila and Kyle and Bunny. Good to be with you. Uh, I am CEO of Big Answers LLC. It's a human capital advisory firm that focuses on helping to unlock diversity, inclusion, belonging for companies in entertainment, technology, asset management, and philanthropy. And we do three things. Uh, one, we help to shift and design culture for inclusion. Two, we help to source senior level diverse talent across organizations. And three, primarily in the nonprofit world, uh, we help to uh, shore up strategy and structure around governance uh, for leveraging nonprofits to do impactful and amazing work. And I'm from Atlanta, live in LA. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for being here. We are so honored and excited to have the three of you to spend some time with the Mirror Digital family. Today, we have a number of clients, colleagues, publishers, um, industry folks, all tuning in to learn a little bit more about how LGBTQ plus voices are impacting change in our community today. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about the industry work you do and really around kind of what it means to you and why it's fulfilling. So please talk to me a little bit about what, what gets you excited and how it's related to your personal identity. And anyone can go first on this one. Toss up. Okay, well, I can go. Um, I am, I feel like because I, I kind of have my hands in a bunch of different industries, creative industries, um, I really feel that through that experience of, you know, the ups and downs of, you know, thinking you're going to be successful, then worrying about you're going to be successful and, and trying to navigate, you know, how you can maintain um, sustainability and how you can maintain happiness and how you can be uh, a person that feels like they belong in the world in their in their careers or whatever pursuits you do. Um, I think that it's really, it's been really important to me to get the message out there that when you make your work about something bigger than yourself, that's when things start opening up for you because you're sort of taking, you know, the ego out of it and realizing it's not just about you, you know, it's about taking your place and your role in the world to create the change that's needed. And that is actually the sustainable juice that keeps you going, right? That's, that's like what I realized. And, I, you know, when I, and I, when I had that realization and found 
the drive through that, I was just so excited about it that I was like, I have to talk about this. You know, I have to talk about what a difference it makes to realize and how empowering it is to realize that you have so much more of a place here than you thought. I love that. I love that. Um, I anyone? Yeah, yeah I mean, so, so for me, I think it's pretty crucial what I'm doing right now in terms of both the, the contribution and the fulfillment element for me personally. I've always been a culture person inside of organizations that's worried about the culture and how to, to sustain it. But often in my career, and not just often, um, most of my career, I was told, that's nice, sell more or do your job. Uh, don't worry about the culture. So for me to be able to, to not just focus on the conversation about how do you maximize uh, the contributions of everyone around the table uh, towards the bottom line is just so vital. Right. And, it, and, and getting paid for it helps immensely. Uh, but it, it's really this notion of how do we drive this organization to serve everyone in it uh, to make it its most productive uh, version of itself. And that's what, for me, diversity, equity, and inclusion are about. And it's, it, you know, it is around you know, Black Lives Matter and trans lives matter and understanding how we all show up and get to, to, to both give most of ourselves, the best of ourselves, but also derive the benefits of that success over the, the, the short, medium, and long term. I love that. Kyle, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think on my end, which is one of the, one of the most fulfilling things at Mirror Digital, is that we're actually now... I think looked more to as consultants of how can we hit the LGBTQ multiracial audiences. So our brains are always working from a marketing standpoint of getting people in front of the audience that look like them, that talk like them, that um, sound like me, you know what I mean? So something like that, that shows you, um, you know, you are valued. We are seeing who you are on there. I think we've come a long way on media in general. Um, you know, small things like Ellen DeGeneres, or not small, but I mean, you know, one show like Ellen DeGeneres to now RuPaul's Drag Race is one of the largest, you know, viewerships in yeah. the country that, you know, now media is kind of seeing that we can have all different types of people in ads shown, you know, same sex couples kissing in an ad for insurance or something like that. So that's one of the most fulfilling things is when brands come to us and say, how can we get um, African-American, LGBTQ, you know, all of these things into something and we're able to guide them through that and get in front of that audience. So it's been wonderful to, I think, give directly back to the audience I belong to. Love it, I love it. Um, so now I wanted to talk a little bit more about personally um, how you feel it's important to show up. You know, there's been a lot more conversation bringing your whole self to work or bringing your whole self to the table. Um, and just for a little bit of background for a lot of our uh, clients on, on, the, um, on the broadcast that may not have as much background in this market, I'd love to talk a little bit about the question about personal pronouns and how we think about personal pronouns that we want to use. Um, and I'd love for each of you to just share your personal pronouns. Um, if you, if they change in certain contexts or, or just how you think about them. And um, yeah, just that's that. my personal pronoun. I'm, I'm she, her, uh, a, a, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, if everybody could go around and share their own uh, and that being a, a sort of straight cis, uh, black woman, uh, that has been my experience, but I'd love to hear what everyone else thinks. Well, I'm, I identify as non-binary and I use they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, and I really just think, you know, normalizing, asking what your pronouns are in any situation, in a work situation or in a social situation is just, you know, it's just the way to go. I think it'll just help everybody get more comfortable with talking about pronouns and, and feeling at ease asking. And I'll jump in, you know, he, 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 him, he, he, him, his are my pronouns. And it's, it's a very important space for me to spend time and think about, as you saw me stumble over that, I understand my privilege 
uh, as a cisgender gay man. And, you know, as, as someone who's, who's been in the, the LGBTQIA plus movement since I came out, uh, mostly as a donor, uh, I was always struck by the challenges around race and identity within the LGBTQ community, right? And so how privilege gets used as a weapon even amongst ourselves. And so I am particularly uh, interested and dedicated to being more sensitive and proactive around, uh, around gender and the construct of gender and, and, and how folks identify. Uh, and it's, it's, I'm from the South, as I said, so it's a challenging space. And I think there's so many challenging spaces within this community. But I think also for companies, there is so much opportunity um, because it creates space for conversation that, that most people in the corporate setting are ill-equipped to have, right? So if, if I come in to a, you know, I'm on a lot of boards and we do diversity training and we always want to do, I'm going to insult somebody here. We always want a 60-year-old black man to talk about unconscious bias. Right, uh, but it's like in that room, I have privilege. I, you know, I'm not in an Oprah Winfrey way, but I have privilege in that room. Uh, and so I think when we talk about something that is so important to uh, the forefront and the leading edge of our community and our activism, that that is so far away from so many parts of, of what folks in the mainstream consider, it has power uh, for us all. Love it. Um, so I identify as he, his, him um, as well. I was extremely lucky to spend 10 years of my life in San Francisco in the early 2000s. And the broadening of what gender is, um, I think really helped change my focus from a young person to an adult, um, which isn't the you know, kind of, I guess, the privilege of a lot of other people. So just the fact that we are discussing it and bringing it to the forefront, I mean, I think as human beings, we all want people to feel, we all want to feel comfort and we want to make other people feel comfortable. So being able to talk about it in a non, um, you know, d don't, don't feel ashamed to ask or be curious or whatever it is, that person's going to respect it, I think, of what they identify with and you can learn more about it and maybe you'll learn something about yourself within it. Um, so I think that's always just a nice way to broaden our intelligence on a human level, which I think we sometimes forget. Thank you. I think, I think sometimes what will help as far as, you know, not creating an awkward situation, you know, when you start off with everybody sharing their pronouns, right, you know, then it's going to normalize it in a way that somebody doesn't feel, you know, that they're being pointed out like, hey, I, I'm not sure about yours, you know, and I think that that can just create this level playing field where everybody, everybody's sharing. So nobody feels like they're being, you know, excluded into something. That's, uh, that's great advice, Benny. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in, Similarly, so much of language is even gendered and thinking about how do we uh, how do we overcome that or how do we navigate that. Um, at Mirror Digital, we use the term Latinx. Um, and Kyle, would you just talk a little bit about um, using Latinx or Hispanic and just some of the conversations we have with clients and in, in, the, in that community? Sure, so Latinx kind of came about as to be more inclusive to a Hispanic community. And that yeah. was, I think, something that was a good effort into trying to be inclusive. There are, you know, as, and this is way beyond my level of expertise, but there's, you know, history on the Hispanic culture coming in and, and that kind of thing and how people identify and, and those types of things. So. Um, we've brought in, we brought Latinx into our vernacular and how we are marketing that kind of thing in the spirit of being as inclusive to people as possible, which I know a lot of people don't identify with it or do not like the term and that kind of stuff. But I do believe um, marketers and agencies and stuff are trying to 
come up with the term and be able to, you know, bring something to the table that's that's all inclusive. I am a Hispanic, and so um, I, I am fine with Latinx and where that is going. And um, you know, Spanish is an interesting language because it does have uh, male and female pronouns on things. So it's um, you know a little bit different than than I think like English or something like that. So it's, it's a tough road, but I think we're making progress. Absolutely. And just uh, building on that, for those of you who don't speak Spanish or are less familiar, um, most of the towns are gender. And so Latinx, um, even if you think of a person would be called Latino, uh, who's male or Latina, who's female. And Latinx allows for inclusion of that space in between if someone is non-binary and doesn't feel like either one of those labels fully represent who they are so it's something that we uh, use uh, as well as um, some people prefer Hispanic some people prefer Chicano but that's another panel discussion so <laughs> I want to move now into um, a conversation about intersectionality that's a word that has been uh, I, 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 want, I want to say thrown around a lot, but a lot of people are talking about intersectionality and there isn't a lot of understanding of sort of what that really means. And when you think about the struggle or the fight for uh, full civil rights for people who have been excluded, uh, whether that's women or people of color, uh, people think of it, or people um, who are LGBTQ, of course, it, you know, people think of it as uh, a group being oppressed, in quotes, in one specific way. But someone like myself, being a black woman, I am faced with, um, I am faced with discrimination based on gender issues uh, as well as on racial issues. So how do those things compound? And that's where we get the question of intersectionality. So I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of what intersectionality means to each of you um, and how do you feel like you experience it? Well, I can go first, I guess. Um, for, you know, for some people, you can't avoid intersectionality because it's just who you are. Absolutely. You know, so I, I, <laughs> I think that, you know, a lot of these terms are being used more often now. And, you know, I've always felt like the term like diversity, I've always been like, well, I'm always in that box somehow, you know, no matter who is around me, I'm like the diversity. Um, so, but intersectionality, it, it's exciting that more people are obviously are becoming more aware um, how these two things, how multiple things collide. Um, and I, I really am happy to see it becoming more of an empowering um, thing, you know, like that's actually a bonus. You know, rather than being like, hold on, wait, we've got to remember intersectionality. It's like, actually, no, this is, this is what the real world is it is intersectional you know so that you know white cis straight isn't always the default right you know intersectionality is the default because we're all we, we, all, we all count and um and i just think it's really fascinating and awesome to be learning about how all the, the different branches of it have affected people in different ways and you know i, I just think it's great that that we're all claiming this as being something to be proud of now. I love it. I would jump in and say, you know, for me, it's really about who you fight for, right? And so the understanding of the, the, the ways in which our plights are intertwined uh, and our destinies are intertwined. Uh, so as much as it is about how I identify, it, it's about who I'm gonna rep for, right? So if I look back to the, uh, the, the pride movement here in Los Angeles this past June and Hollywood Boulevard was painted with the mural, All Black Lives Matter, which was super controversial, right? Even on my own social, people were like, why do we have to say all? Uh, and it was about saying, look, if I am about the fight for LGBT equality, I have to, to, to lean into the space of those who are who are most oppressed and least recognized in my community, uh, because the the suffering of the uh, most intensely persecuted is my suffering, no matter where I sit, right? 
And so I think for there to be gay liberation, uh, and just to note, my father was a liberation theologist, which was about a theology for Black people that was not rooted in the structures of Christianity that were uh, in support of slavery through scripture, right? It was about finding how do you find freedom for Black people in the Bible and not uh, excuses for people to enslave us. Uh, I think about liberation for LGBT people in the same way. And intersectionality for me, my uh, white LGBT counterparts, my Latinx LGBT counterparts, my trans counterparts, all puts us in this inextricable connection where we have to, to stand up for and fight for each other. Yeah, I, that was so much more eloquently put than I could ever do. So um, you can tell my dad was not a theology professor. Um, that was amazing. Um, but yes, I definitely echo that, you know, there's so many differences and within all of our differences, there's the same. And just, you know, being able to recognize a struggle within a community should be what we all need to stand for as a community that has been persecuted and need to change and improve. So um, mine's going to be very short and sweet because that was much more eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> But just as impactful, thank you, Kyle. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, so I want to talk, oh, did you want to say something? Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit more about, and Brooks and you already started to talk, talk about this. You talked a lot about this, but some of the conversations around intersectionality in the LGBT community, and specifically, you know, today we're bringing forth LGBTQ plus multicultural voices. And so, you know, e even that felt novel to some folks when I was talking about it because <clears throat> there isn't often this conversation about people of color distinctly in the LGBTQ plus community who are not part of that community. So kind of as allies and ally, thinking about how we have this conversation was really exciting for me and I just would love to hear what are, you know, what are the insiders? You guys are the insiders. What, what, how do you guys think about it and how are you talking about intersectionality within the community? I think my experience um, recently in the past few months has been um, way more focused on, you know, bias and racism within um, POC communities um, as well and, and within queer communities as well. You know, the transphobia that still exists in the queer community, um, the, the racism that exists in the Latinx community, you know, and I think that it's been hard for people who experience discrimination, right? Being like, say somebody like me, like I've been, I've experienced racism, but that doesn't mean that somebody like me can't be racist. And I think having that conversation and sort of making that bridge where, you know, yet, yes, you've had that type of suffering, but it's not the same. And, you know, I've been trying to be really, really focused on getting more people who are in my community to realize their own privileges within it, you know, and how important that is. And, and because you have experience with it, you can have more compassion. You know, that, that isn't an empowering thing, you know, because you've been there. So I've been really trying to make the conversation about that. I love it. I mean, I, I don't have a lot to add there, right? I mean, I think that 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 reveals the tensions. Um, I think you know, hurt people hurt, right? Is sort of the, the challenge, and so you have to overcome that. And I think there's such a journey in terms of the coming out process that people may not understand or outside that experience, right? And, and, and so I think even within our own community, and I guess where I'll take that intersectionality place is. You know, for a, for a generational perspective, from a generational perspective, the, the, the sort of the, the corner of or the center of, of our movement or our community that's bisexual is can, can be controversial, right? Yeah. Um, and, and if you're black and bi, it's super controversial, right? Because you think about if you're old enough, you think about you know the the, the DL, the down low, and so that whole this whole sort of thing around. Um, just the, the, the uh, 
sort of demonization of, of our sexuality. Uh, and so someone who, who ultimately sits at that intersection of straight and gay ends up with, with issues from all sides, right? And, and so I think about that as something that my generation struggles with and that even I struggle with, you know, to get very personal in terms of people you'll date, right? And so I think that the interesting thing about the intersectionality question, the interesting thing about uh, sort of the, the, the LGBT movement is that the political is personal. It's not, it's never not personal, but here it is super personal, right? And, and so that becomes super charged and that's a, that's a challenge. And I think to, to bring it to the business space for a second, when you're marketing to us and you have no sensitivity about this, this is not a message of don't market to us. It is a message of you need people inside your organization who know what the hell they're doing. Uh, because this is in no way simple for us. And if you're going to sort of, you know, skip in and spread your advertising around, there might be some problems. Well said. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's what, you know, I kind of touched on this in the beginning is I am feeling like brands are coming to Mirror Digital in that how can I learn what I should do in order to hit these different layers. And, um, you know, as Sheila kind of mentioned that people are, are just learning about this when, you know, a lot of us are living this and have lived this our whole lives, you know, so it's nothing new to us, um, but that it is becoming more of the forefront from an advertiser's perspective of being inclusive, learning that there are people of color, there's people who are mixed that don't, look like what the stereotypical person looks like in their mind. And you need to have those people in the forefront too. So there is all of those types of things. I think the biggest thing that we can do to help and what Mirror Digital has really done is education and being very you know, straightforward with it on this is the audiences. These are, this is how it's changing. This is how you need to change. You know, it's not 1952 and we're you know, all trying to hawk one thing to every person that's on, you know, the 13 stations on TV. So, um, and there's so many more platforms now to reach it as well. So being able to see the different faces of the people working with agencies, I think is just marvelous. And every type of, you know, ethnicity and human out there, I think is just, I think we're, I think we're going in a better direction with so much education. People like us being upfront about who we are and how we identify and how we want to be marketed to. I want to jump into you a little bit for the yeah, comment. I mean, I think there's also an onus on people to self-educate. Uh, I, would, I would endorse all day, hire Mirror, Mirror Digital. But I think that, <laughs> you know, beyond that, there's some hard work you can do because there are thousands of channels out there that you can go out and figure this out, right? And so, what I like least is with, and, and, and so my business is helping people figure this out, but what I like, the question I like least is, what should I read? What should I watch, all right? It's like, you should read the guide on your cable <laughs> channel box. You should read the scroll on Netflix. Just go to gay <laughs> and just see what it says. <laughs> just dive on in. So I do think it is the onus the, the onus is on the consumer, but also on the client that comes to us to, to self-curate, right? To curate for themselves, because there's so much out there. Uh, the quality as someone who came out in the 90s is so much better than SLI in 2000. But they came out, you know, that, sorry, watching gay content in the 90s. It's asterisk. There's so much that was not great, and it's great now. And so if you, if you want to just dive into... Hulu or dive into Netflix or dive into Amazon Prime or even dive into Disney Plus. There is just a sea of content that you can explore in a very intimate, personal way where you'll have those stories well beyond just one Ellen uh, in the nice days. I had to give a read, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's that's absolutely right. Uh, things are so accessible, uh, and, you know, with this, with the media world that we live in, that is 
so diversified and so on demand and so available. Um, there are stories in so many places and in so many flavors uh, that there's just not one way and you can learn that there are lots of different ways to be part of the LGBT community or any community. Um, I do want to talk a little bit more about media because you guys are all in media in one way, shape or form. So, you know, the work that Kyle and I do is like true media, you know, like in terms of advertisers and working with publishers. Um, Bunny, as an artist, you are creating media for mass consumption in different forms that has a message and a way to connect emotionally that's so beautiful. And, um, and Brixen, um, your work with Big Answers helps people navigate how they're going to be communicating um, their messaging, both if on a large scale, on a small scale and a large scale. And then certainly your work with the Black House Foundation is really <clears throat> really critical in storytelling and in media. So I'd like to start with Kyle and really hear a little bit about um, with this sort of everybody has kind of ripped off the mask and is coming out as them true their true selves and really uh, being a lot more uh, direct and forthcoming about who they are and what they need as a consumer. And a lot of that has been driven by the Black Lives and the social justice movements where people are like, okay, we've had it up to here. This is who I am and I'm not apologizing for it and deal with it. So have we seen that having an impact on how we think about LGBTQ media, um, LGBTQ publishers, how advertisers are thinking about um, people of color in the LGBTQ space. Can you just talk a little bit about any trends or questions or things that we're seeing there? Sure, I think from a publisher standpoint, um, a lot of the typical LGBTQ media back in the day was considered more salacious. And now it is far more mainstream. So you've seen people like, uh, you know, Grindr has now branched off. They have an into more, um, that's more of a uh, everyday kind of topical information about the LGBTQ community. So normalizing what, normalizing what the, the sites and them being deemed LGBTQ, I think has come a very long way. Um, I think there's still more to, Go and I believe um, brands are kind of seeing the value of that and seeing the different voices within the publishers. So now we're seeing editors and personalities and that kind of stuff up front saying their point of view. And sometimes their point of view is very strong, which is great. And you're seeing, you know, people of color and um, that type of thing in there. So I do think that it's become very prevalent and even now the kind of mainstream media is like a CNN or a Yahoo or something like that are linking uh, mainstream articles from an LGBTQ site or something like that that's on the homepage of what something is covered. It doesn't matter if it's LGBTQ or something, they're covering something that's real, a protest, um, Pride Month, any of those types of things. and. Um, seeing where where that is going. So um, I do think it is becoming more prevalent and brands are embracing the voices and how different those voices are. Love it, love it, love it. Um, so Bunny, your career is global and you have fans all around the world. How has the Black Lives Matter and the movement for social justice here, how have those movements impacted your fans, your work? like? What, what new space has that brought you into as a, as a creative artist? Well, because a lot of my work deals with um, emotional health and self-compassion, um, it's been taken off in the Trump years because a lot of people out there are, just need support. You know, a lot of people are feeling alone. A lot of people, you know, need friends. And when you make yourself avail available to people in a way that feels like they matter, then it's going to make a huge difference, you know, and people can really feel authenticity and they can really like have a sense of um, being genuine. So as the, this BLM happened and I was confronting my own privilege and doing it openly on my platform, 
and, you know, saying things like, it's okay to get it wrong. You know, it's okay to admit you got it wrong. It's okay to be, to, to grow. And, and now I got like such a great response out of that honesty and that humility. And I think that people genuinely just want, uh, they want to see that kind of humility, you know, and, and I don't think we see that very much at all. You know, it's that people are so afraid to get it wrong now. Um, and they're so embarrassed to be point out that they got something wrong, that they get their defenses up. And I understand that. But when you come at it with, oh, I can learn, like I'm able to learn too, and I can learn from you, um, it, it makes a huge, huge difference. So that's really what I'm getting a sense of is that people really, really just, they want to see people being their best selves. Not only do they want to be their best selves, they want to see people being their best selves as well. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I love that, you, you know, talking about not having fear of getting it wrong because these, these issues are so complex to navigate. And um, one thing I learned from my play niece, who I love to always just bring up this point, you know, we've had this, uh, you know, she's tw 20, no, she's 19 and she's a freshman in college. And she's talked about how on social media, there's this whole culture of calling people out and the whole cancel culture and how, they're really starting to move away from that. And when people get it wrong, it's not about calling you out, it's about calling you in. So it's about explaining, you know, this is why that, what you did or what you said doesn't work. And this is how it impacts me. And this is how we can do it differently. And coming at it from a point of empathy versus a point of, um, you know, aggravation or anger or well you know you're going to feel the emotion that you feel but thinking about how you bring that person in versus excluding them based on the mistake that they've made and it's also talking about that when somebody's pointing that out to you that that's an act of service you know like when if somebody's taking the time to point something out to you that maybe you didn't know we also have to you know look at it like they're not trying they're doing you a favor <laughs> you know, you, you're always, at the time it feels horrible, but you're always glad that it happened then so that further on you didn't make the same mistake. And so, you know, it's also talking about being, being grateful for the fact that there are people out here doing this emotional work for you and, and, and giving you a direction to look in. You know, it really, it takes, it's, it's not easy to be that person. It's not easy to hold those truths and and feel this pressure to say it because you just don't want this to continue. You know, that having the burden of not knowing if they should say something or saying it, you know, that's, that's an incredible weight that an incredible service that they're doing too as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, Brixton, I'd love to hear your perspective on this, you know, given what's happened with the black lives matter and social justice movements, you know, the connection to your work in DEI and also, I would love for you to talk a little bit about Black House and how that has reverberated through the work that you're doing there, just so folks can kind of get a sense of what's going on in corporate and then kind of what's going on in sort of independent storytelling that you're so much a part of. Let me add a third, which is just sort of in the, in the culture. And I'll, I'll start there. Uh, okay. you know, it, it strikes me when we talk about in this conversation about people's discomfort with getting it wrong. Right, and it reminds me of, of this sort of this sort of model that puts cultural appropriation here, right, and complete sort of denial here. And, and so, what I think we want you to do is never go here and never sit here, right? We don't want you to be in complete denial. We don't want you to appropriate us and our culture without not acknowledging us and paying us, right? So, so I think about. Uh, Madonna and the Vogue craze, right? And how we just, the world just appropriated this ballroom culture. And I don't even know, maybe there's somebody on the call who's a sort of Madonna, you know, circa what year for, for Vogue, right? I think that was in the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. And now we're in 2020 and you're just getting posed, right? So, that took a long time and a lot of appropriation of a culture without attribution or compensation, which is super hard to digest and to take. And so I think that's that, that I think that sort of 
those poles, that, that bipolar sort of structure help us to think about where we need to be. You know, appreciate my culture, appreciate the black woman, appreciate the black, uh, you know, ballroom culture, but don't take it and steal it and make money off it and leave us behind. That's, that's, that, that feels like a good bumper if you need bumpers on your car, uh, front and back. Uh, you need to be somewhere in between. Uh, and then in terms of, of, of my business and big answers, we really work with companies, again, to understand how to engage without being extractive, without extracting uh, as you would a mine and just taking the gold and running off, but in order to figure out how to invest in the community and build more opportunity for the, the community overall. So, you know, we do that around technology and that's around representation and who you hire and who you bring in. We do it around uh, asset management, which means who gets to pick the stocks. And if we're going to be a majority minority country and you have people picking stocks in your company and they have no idea what the tastes are of communities of color, you might have a problem as much or more of a problem than the companies that are making products for these communities they don't understand or don't have real connections to. And then finally, you know, philanthropy is a big deal because it's so rife with privilege and judgment and and sort of this this big seat, little seat dynamic where I'm in the big seat, I have the money, you're in the little seat asking for it. And in the big seat, I get to dictate the work you do in your community despite my lack of knowledge about your community and its needs. And that leads to entertainment, which Black House has been working on for the last 13 years to create spaces for Black creators to not only tell their own stories, not only sell their own stories, but to benefit monetarily from the structure that gets those stories out to audiences, which is a virtuous cycle that makes those stories more authentic. Uh, when we were talking a little bit earlier, I, I thought about you know, truth in casting. Uh, there are so many Oscar winners for best actor or best actress who are playing LGBT characters. There are just not enough roles going around for out LGBT folks. For, for straight people to be cast in those roles. They're not, a, they're, uh, they're not enough roles uh, for, uh, for people, for disabled folks to be casting people who are able-bodied in their roles. Uh, and, and so in Black House, while we focus on Black folks, therefore our name, we've been an incubator for so many other groups and a champion for so, other, so many other underrepresented folks on the festival landscape in the conversations around who gets to be an executive on the below the line, meaning who gets to be a gaffer and an editor and a makeup and hair artist and thinking about our entire community and creating space for all those people who, for whom there had not been space before. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now about, you know, monetizing these things. So, you already went there a little bit, Brixton, when you talk about let's start at Madonna and then we end up at Pose and it takes 30 years before people who are creating, who are the creators in this space and the uh, who are birthing um, the content, the creativity, the media are, are being able to benefit from it. So um, Kyle, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, media agencies, are they looking for and advertisers looking for um, LGBTQ people of color. Are you seeing more um, requests for that? Um, and I, I know we're seeing some given the rise in the Black Lives Matter movement, but just are, are, are there other areas that, you know, as people are starting to think about being inclusive, where we're gonna see dollars flowing into media outlets that serve underrepresented communities and sustain them? Sure, yeah. So we've definitely seen, um, I guess, more of an influx within the multicultural ethnicity race community. LGBTQ, as far as I've seen, is still more cyclical. So what I mean by that is it's still tentpoled by LGBTQ events. So pride, um, if there's award shows, something, something like that, it's not necessarily an always on. Um, which I think should change as LGBTQ plus people are always on the internet and always in the world. Uh, <laughs> You're not only on the internet during Pride? <laughs> I'm more, yeah, that's the only time that I get on the internet is Pride. Uh, so um, that I think is one of the biggest things. I think we've seen a lot from, you know, fr from race and multicultural ethnic 
um, advertising, but LGBTQ, I still think has a, a ways to go that isn't associated with events or cyclical advertising. Mm -hmm. And anything in that intersection, so specifically uh, focus on multicultural LGBTQ people? I, I do think now that we are seeing specifically in creatives and that kind of stuff, a broader version of the LGBTQ culture. So you're seeing African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, that kind of stuff in there when before it would, you know, most likely be, you know, two hunky white guys with the perfect, you know, stereotypical body and that kind of thing. We're seeing all shapes and sizes. We're seeing all different hair textures, skin colors, you know, everything, which is great. And that's what we need to see. Our community is, I think, a vulnerable community because, you know, there's a lot of emotional, there's shame in some people's eyes and that kind of stuff that we need to be visible for a younger generation coming up and wanting to be who they are and seeing that they can be who they are. And, you know, being in Los Angeles, you're in a bubble that isn't, you know, as restricted or where you need to be as careful or something like that than other parts. So I hope that brands go forward with it and have it always on and show the different people because it does make you feel normalized and you can see yourself in something and, and you're not alone in, in that kind of aspect of things. Absolutely. We're not just at Pride in a parade. <laughs> um, funny, can you talk a little bit about your work? You know, you share so much of, I mean, these amazing stories and so much of who you are on content platforms that are quote unquote free. So how are you um, able to generate uh, you know, a successful, uh, sustainable living from those things. And, and, and has that changed given that people are more focused on supporting people of color and artists of color in general? Yeah, um, well, two things. I've been able to really utilize crowdfunding um, with a larger audience and through services like Patreon, mm -hmm. um, Kickstarter, things where it's like, it, and, it, and it feels amazing because it feels like, community-based um, and it feels like it's under my rules and I don't have to you know go by any like a, a brand certain um, limitations because to be honest as somebody who is approached by brands um, it's it's a very fine line um, with who you want to work with now because at this point you, if you work with the wrong company, even though the money might be great, um, you might lose some of your audience because you know, you're supposed to stand by your principles and yet you're working with this company. Um, you also have to be careful that other brands aren't just using your art, um, using your message, your creativity and, and taking it and appropriating it and using it for theirs and and so, yeah, just being on social media as an artist is, is, has a lot of challenges, even though it has a lot of benefits, obviously. Um, it's given me access is to in a way that I could never have had before. And that's why I always like say, you know, it's all worth it because it's giving so many people an accessibility they never had. It's so, mm -hmm. much, so much talent, you know, so many gifts, so much great perspective. Um, but when it comes to the brand thing, you know, I've been there where I've done an ad with companies and, and I've really gotten crap for it. And you have to really, um, it really helps if the, if the company is already doing good work, <laughs> is already conscious, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't seem like, oh, they're just picking you out during pride and, and they're, they want to like capitalize on your, your, your coming out story, which is also like a really emotionally difficult thing you know and it's like and, and like here let's let's capitalize in the moment where you overcame your shame and then we'll sell something with that you know and and so like I, I, I think when companies are reaching out um, to queer people to work with them or cast them I, you know the way they they the way that they speak the if they have some kind of consciousness some kind of education about you know, being respectful, um, obviously, and of people's pronouns, for example. Uh, I can't tell you how many times um, being misgendered 
which, you know, having to correct over and over and over again um, and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, it, it, it's I think it's growing and I think it's great that people are able, that I'm able to make money through that. But it is it it's always kind of you kind of really have to think about if it's really the right thing for you, because now that you can be supported by your audience, it's like, you know, you really have to weigh your options. Okay. Fair enough. And are you, well, are you having more brands reach out in this time? Just even if they are not, they're necessarily the right brands or is that a, is that a thing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's been the past few years, I think ever since Trump was elected, um, it definitely, like, I feel like increased the visibility of queer people. Um, and, and also, I, I, I also feel like the younger generation is, you know, just from what I've seen on social media and stuff, it, it's, it's, they're so much more open, they're so much more gender fluid, they're so much more inclusive, you know, and this word queer has sort of become this word that, in, that, that includes it all. And, you know, bisexual, pansexual, trans, um, non-binary, all of it. And um, I think that that's really cool and exciting. So if you want to, like, get into the language of, like, younger people, like, you know, you got to really, like, tap into, like, their consciousness, really. Awesome. Awesome. And, and Brixen, same thing. So in terms of there's a lot of lip service about supporting um, people of color in, in these movements. Have you seen that actually where conversations have turned into checks or new opportunities? Yeah, they've turned so, to our model at Black House has been a sponsorship model. So we've been partnering with folks who, who mean it for, you know, 13 years. Um, the challenges, they typically are centered around activations that they have or product launches and in the media space. That means a show or a movie at a festival or, or coming out in a, in a release window. I think, you know, if I switch back from, from my work at Black House to my work at Big Answers, where I have demanded rubber to the road is internally, right? And so uh, I've been really hard on companies that want to issue a statement and write a big check and then go back to business as usual. Uh, because there's somebody who's non-binary, there's somebody who's uh, black and, and gay in your organization who's been disadvantaged uh, by the structural racism and homophobia inside of there. You know? And so I push my prospective clients and the people who become my clients, my firm's clients, to that work, to say what's going to happen in performance reviews, what's going to happen in hiring, what's going to happen in pay. How are you going to overcome the pay inequities that are so rampant uh, for, you know, these disadvantaged groups before you even get to the interse intersectionality of disadvantage, mm -hmm. right? So if you are a black, lesbian, single parent, I mean, the, the, just the, the, the obstacles that are in front of you and the disadvantages that you're going to face and the, the way making that an employer can provide that person just just monumental so that's where i'm pushing you know I, I love the statements i love the big checks to the to the sometimes obvious organizations but i'm demanding that you go back you know at a, at a minimum and look at your board and your executive suite and the pictures you put on your website uh and and in a full throated and fully invested way think about how every one of your organization is impacted by these issues love it i love it i love it well, sadly, I can't believe it, but we're at time. So I do want to see if uh, the audience has any questions. Let's see if I can figure out how to get to the questions. Hmm. Participants. Okay. Attendees. Let's see if you guys can, is there a chat function? Can you ask questions? I don't think that that will... All right, guys, I don't think I have a question. Oh, wait, let's see. Chat. Okay, here we go. Q&A. All right. Does anyone have any questions for our esteemed panelists? We only have a couple of minutes, so I'll only be able to take maybe one or two at the most. Mm -hmm. Giving everyone a moment to think. You guys are so thorough. You've answered everything. Amazing.
I do have a question for, for, for Bonnie, if, if I could. Oh, absolutely. So, so, so I, I don't know where you are, Bonnie. I'd love to know where you are. And then ah. how the lack of ability to travel, I understand your career is pretty global. How, how have you managed that sort of being in that space? And, and, and what are you seeing out in the rest of the world that we should be thinking about? Well, I'm in Brooklyn. <laughs> so I've been holed up in my Crown Heights apartment, you know, just making stuff. Um, and, you know, I remember when the lockdown first happened, I felt this incredible pressure to like, oh, I need to start a new video series and I need to do this and I need to go live on IG like every week and I need to, you know what I mean? And, and I think like all creatives sort of felt that kind of pressure during the, during the lockdown and now that we have all this time at home. Um, and basically now I've sort of evened out to realize that we, we, you just have to do the best that you can really. Um, and I always like to have different seeds in the, in every single like pot, but, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to weigh, you know, obviously working hard with also taking care of, um, myself during this, these difficult times. Um, and most of my work does speak about, you know, the issues that we're all going through and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it hasn't been that easy. And also I used to perform, um, do shows and do speaking events and obviously can't do those anymore. And I really miss having an audience. I really miss the human contact. And there's, there's something that you just don't get, uh, unless you're in the same room with people um and to really know how you're affecting them and uh but yeah i'm hopeful that someday soon <laughs> we can be back together thank you fabulous thank you well thank you guys all we're just over whoa dropping notes here we're just over time here so uh i appreciate you all again Bunny, thank you so much. Brixen, okay. thank you. Kyle, thank you. It's been wonderful having you all, and I appreciate your helping to make Mirror Moments Episode 3 a fantastic success.